Draft Mechanic is a proud member of Punchboard Media. Pull up a chair at punchboardmedia.com. Draft Mechanic, episode 93. On this episode of Draft Mechanic, we discuss recent plays of Junk Orbit and Carcassonne Safari. We've got a six-pack review of the Quacks of Quedlinburg, as well as an on-tap. We've got a beer sub-primer on Baltic Porters, and in the final round, we asked our Slack channel what they're looking forward to in 2019. So sit back, relax, grab a pint, and enjoy the show. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Draft Mechanic. I'm Jake. And I'm Danielle. And Draft Mechanic is the podcast about board games and craft beer and anything we can do to tie the two together. Here at Draft Mechanic, we like our beer like we like our board games. Mm, with just the right mixture of ingredients. Yeah, And, and sure. or components and or mechanics, I guess. Just the right ones. <laughs> well, we've got a few different things about ingredients we're talking about today. Obviously, we have the Quacks of Quedlinburg as our feature, which is all about mixing just the right ingredients. Hopefully, you get the right stuff in your pot. And you're talking about the Baltic Porter, which is a very specific kind of thing. So, I don't know. Maybe that's a specific kind of ingredients. We'll find out in the beer primer, right? I already know. So, <laughs> Well, hey, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Draft Mechanic. If it's your first time here, thanks for joining us. If you're a returning listener, we love you so much as well. You can find us on the internet, draftmechanic.net. And uh, actually, we actually have another website. And I'm sure I told you this at some point. I bought the boardgames.beer website. So I we did also not have know that. that. No. We also have boardgames.beer. If for some reason that is easier for you to remember, I don't know. It was, it was like 20 bucks. Why not? Uh, you can find us on social media at Draft Mechanic on all of your Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, usual kinds of places, too. We also have a Board Game Geek Guild. That guild number is 2470. So if you want to swing by there, there will be a thread up for this episode as well as every previous episode and every coming episode, as far as I can tell. Yeah. And if you have an opinion on something we're talking about or you just want to join the conversation, that is an excellent place to do it. If you are on Board Game Geek, we do also have a micro badge. And we have six new micro badgers in this episode. Such That's- a tiny badge. Such little badgers. We have Quentin Dreger from Boards Alive, Will Foy, Ryan Cornell, Stinking Benjamin, Jess Paxton, and Jeremy Hack. That is 57 total micro badgers. We are on episode 93, and it's been picking up a lot recently. I am challenging you listeners out there. Can we get to 100 people with the Draft Mechanic micro badge by episode 100? It's entirely possible. It's entirely up to you listeners out there. I know that there are more than uh, 43 more listeners out there (laughs) that don't have the micro badge. I'm going to bet on no... But okay. Well, pr- hey, listeners, let's prove, prove, Dan- me prove Danielle wrong. wrong. Uh, if you do need geek gold for that, by the way, you can hop in our board game geek gold. We have a thread pinned for it. I've got tons of geek gold. You've got tons of geek gold. We've got other people with geek gold, and we just want to see if we can get to 100 by episode 100. I don't know. Maybe we'll find out some kind of contest or something we can do specifically with micro badges. I just came up with that now. But we it's probably should have possible. discussed this before we were recording it. I'm gonna give away a coaster. What? I don't know. We got coasters. But we don't have <laughs> our coasters. You're just going to give someone a coaster? Yeah, I don't know. We'll I'll find a really nice coaster or something. This is not a guaranteed contest. <laughs> this is a bad contest is what that is. Danielle, save us. Okay. If you happen to be in the Charlotte, North Carolina area, we do twice monthly meetups, one on the first Thursday of every month and one on the third Tuesday of every month. That means the next one is going to be on February 7th at Good Road Cider Works. Mm-hmm. That is the first Thursday of February, and we would love for you to come out, have some cider, try their mead. They have some non-alcoholic beverages. They have some beer if you're like... Like, hardcore, we'll only drink beer, only ever. Mm. It is a great space. We have a great time there, and we would love for you to join us. Good tables, good lighting, good road. That's my new slogan for them. Am I allowed to make up slogans? You are, but they're not required <laughs> to use them. Okay, a little bit of convention news, because it is the beginning of convention season. Gen Con housing is next Sunday. Ah, uh, Yeah, no, let's yeah. not talk about that any longer. If you are looking <laughs> to get into Gen Con housing... Have your badge by next Sunday. This is my like my one release about the low level anxiety of this first month of Gen Con season is that I get to mention it on the podcast and everybody else out there is going to have like a little cringe as well. Like, oh, no, I got to do that, too. Um, other things. We are on our way to Whose Turn Is It Anyway up in Durham, North Carolina this coming weekend. I'm really excited. This is an invite only kind of thing that we have not had a chance to go to in the past. So if you are attending, uh, drop us a line on the Internet and I would love to say hi and play a game or something. It does seem like they have greatly opened up the invites though oh, yeah. so it was like anybody who's going can invite anybody mm-hmm. that they think is not terrible so it's like a 
you need to know, but you, it's not you got, not you really gotta exclusive. Know. Yeah, you got to know. And then our local favorite convention, Mega Moose Con, announced their dates for 2019. Usually this has been in August in the past, but some construction at the convention center, they are moving it to October 25th through 27th. This is down in Richburg, South Carolina. I know recently on Twitter, Beth Sobel had asked people what conventions they would be really upset if they had to miss mm-hmm. in the coming year. And Mega MooseCon was definitely one of my answers. It was She said pick three, and it was definitely one of my answers. It is a great time we have every year, and I'm excited to see what Mark can do with the renovated space that they're going to have. Good luck. I'm excited. Cannot wait to get back to Mega MooseCon again You this must year. wait till October. I will wait, but I will not want to. I don't know. Such a weirdo. Moving on. News about games. Um, I was really excited about this. We got an email, and there was a big old press blast in the entire world, that Direwolf Digital, the digital gaming studio that has brought us uh, implementations of Lantern and Lotus, and also are the kind of the brains behind Clank and the bringing that, obviously, with the enhanced app stuff, they are releasing six games for all the various devices in 2019. They're starting off with Raiders of the North Sea in quarter one, and then the list also includes Mage Knight, Root, Yellow and Yangtze, Wings of Glory, and Sagrada. This is a really good list of games. This is a heck of a slate for one year of releases from one studio. I mean, Root is definitely going to have to have either pass and play or online play, I would think. Mm-hmm. I mean, you could theoretically play just one person against AI, but that would sort of take the fun out of that game. So this is quite a bit they're biting off. Yeah, no, just the thought of, I mean, Root and Mage Knight are two huge games in terms of probably the complexity of coding. And obviously, nothing to sneeze at with the other four here. I'm super excited about Raiders of the North Sea and obviously Sagrada. Obviously. The thought, the thought that I could play Sagrada in, you know, 10 to 15 minutes now in my pocket is so exciting. So I cannot wait to see what they do. And Direwolf Digital has done awesome stuff before. I love the Lanterns app. It's super gorgeous. It was kind of like at the beginning of the wave of like tons of app releases. And we've seen uh, Digitize get into the app space. Obviously, Asmodee Digital is doing a bunch. Handelabra is doing a whole bunch. I'm really expecting 2019 to be the year for app gaming. I really feel there's a lot of stuff coming in the near future that's going to be a big, big space. So I'm excited for this. I definitely feel like we've said that before about like 2017 and 2018, (laughs) but technology continues to blur the lines in different like Mm -hmm. hobby spaces. So this is unsurprising, but cool. Mm -hmm. So I'm really looking forward to that. I'm sure we'll be talking about Raiders of the North Sea when that is released, because that's a good game and I like to play it on my phone. (laughs) We assume. All right. Next games news item that I have, the second expansion for Roll for the Galaxy has been announced, and this is apparently releasing in February or March. The expansion is called Rivalry, and it's actually three expansions in one. The first section kind of has your typical more of everything. It's got new tiles, new dice, start factions, and home worlds. The second part of the expansion has an assets trading thing where you basically can trade anything at all, like you can trade your tiles or maybe extra parts of your income track or other dice or all this other crazy stuff. Like there's a lot of different options for trading. And then the third one is a customizable dice expansion. Everybody gets one of these orb dice that you can replace the different faces on and you roll it publicly at the beginning of your turn. Everybody has one. And then you all see what everybody gets is their particular thing. It's They kind of explain it as almost a tech tree die building thing. All of these expansions sound really cool and really interesting, but here's the kicker. This is all one box and it's going to be retailing for $80. So that is an expansion that's $20 more expansion than the base game. Danielle, your thoughts on this? You said that there was a trading thing in this. Can I trade this for Race for the Galaxy? Ah... Because I don't like Roll for the Galaxy, so I'm certainly not spending $80 on an expansion for Assuming that Race for the Galaxy didn't exist, and Roll for the Galaxy is how you got your engine building fixed. What do you think about, like, specifically, I'm thinking about, we're putting the three expansions in one, but it's a big price tag. I don't think I've seen this kind of thing before, other than, I don't know, uh, Viticulture's Tuscany expansion, kind of the same thing, a bunch of modules, but they're all a lot smaller. And Tuscany, I don't believe, was more than Viticulture when it initially launched. It's certainly a bold move to say, okay, we're giving you a ton of content. We're not making you wait for the content because they obviously have it done. But the price tag, I think, is going to scare a lot of people away. You can already buy Roll for the Galaxy and the, what was it, Ambition expansion and be under this price point still, right? Or at least at this price point? With, you know, some smart buying, I'm sure you could. I don't see like if you weren't already a huge fan of roll for the galaxy there's no way you're buying this yeah if you are a big fan of roll for the galaxy 
and you really want a ton more stuff to add to it, I guess maybe you buy that. Yeah. But if you really like World for the Galaxy that much, do you want to add this much more stuff to it? I don't know. Maybe somebody does. But yeah. I'd be hesitant because I'm – like I look at that and I say, okay, if it's an $80 expansion, maybe $40 out of it is anything I want hmm. in any way. That being said, Terraforming Mars broke out all its <laughs> expansions into a bunch of tiny little bits and mm-hmm. we weren't super thrilled about that either. Maybe I just don't want that much expansion to a game. Yeah. But either way, I am not the target market for this. Like I said, this is not my game. Mm. How do you feel about it? I am the target market. I am a big fan of Roll for the Galaxy, and the price tag is big. But from reading up on it, apparently some of the expansions do share some of the components. So if they had broken this out into three different expansions, we'd be looking more at like $120 total for the three expansions over the period of release. Apparently this box is just like really jam-packed full of stuff to the point where it's going to increase the amount of content in this game significantly. And I've been waiting, I think, two, maybe three years for another expansion for Roll for the Galaxy. And, you know, I was kind of at this point wondering, I guess this is just a dead game at this point. But it is a game I like a lot, but I haven't brought out in a long time. I think what's gotten me most excited about this is, with honestly, of the three expansions in here, the one that I'm least excited about is the More Stuff expansion. Because the other two expansion ideas sound really cool, and it sounds like it's going to really change the gameplay. I love this customizable dice tech tree thing. I want to see that in action. I like the thought of bringing trading into this game to make it more interactive, because I feel like that's something that Roll for the Galaxy didn't have a whole lot of, any kind of interaction. And then More Stuff is always more stuff, so that's always that pretty good. That is the good. truest thing I can think of. <laughs> more Stuff is always always more stuff. But it is a really interesting way to release this expansion. A spoiler, I'm probably going to find a way to get this at some point. I'm obviously going to try to use the internet to my advantage to make that happen because $80 is a high price tag. But I like Roll for the Galaxy and I'm really excited to get more of it. So I don't know. It's going to be interesting to see how this goes and if other people take this kind of cue in the future to bundle a bunch of expansions together. We'll see, because this is going to be the first one that I can really think of that's got this high of a price tag on it. Moving on to additional content in the future. Danielle, shall we move into Kickstarter land? We shall. How about those updates? Well, first we're going to do a second update on Stonehenge and the Sun from it. When we talked about this last episode, it hadn't reached its funding goal, I don't mm-hmm. believe, but it had funded. Uh, it ended between the last episode and this one, and they funded at $22,366 okay. of their $20,241 goal. So they didn't blow it out of the water, but they are going to get this game made with 297 backers. Cool. Vital Lacerda's Railways of Portugal from Eagle Griffin Games is funding at $51,339 of its $10,000 goal with 904 backers. They have some stretch goals unlocked and some additional promo cards that are going to be available to backers. This one is still going on. Yeah, I think it's within the 48 hour window as of time of recording so if you're listening day of and you didn't already know about this and this is in your wheelhouse you have seconds probably a lot of seconds but seconds nonetheless and finally the folded space board game inserts campaign number three has funded at 164,447 pounds of their 10,000 pound goal They have 4,366 backers, and their pledge manager will open on January 25th, which Mm -hmm. is just this coming week if you're listening to this when it comes out. Yeah, I'm excited to see what else they add on. They got the Dinosaur Island insert funded, and they've done a lot of upgrading to old inserts to include expansions and stuff like that. So when I go in for that pledge manager, I might take a look around and see if there's anything that I'd missed the first time around. And I guess you can hop in that pledge manager later if you still want to get some of this product. Uh, They look pretty neat. I'm hoping they turn out to be solid. There you go. So in new projects, we'll really quickly mention our sponsors, Gray Fox Games, have a campaign going for War of the Worlds, The New Wave. It's currently funding at 96000 of its $10,000 goal with a little over 1,500 backers. This one ends Thursday, January 31st with an estimated delivery of August 2019. You can back it $39 for the base game, $44 to add the expansion deck, and $59 for the expansion, the base, and the neoprene playmat. Everyone loves a neoprene playmat. Mm-hmm. It's a two-player asymmetric deck building game. It's got aliens. You can go check out the Kickstarter page for some really great run-throughs. Other projects to talk about. The first one I would like to bring up is the Suburbia Collector's Edition. This is coming from Bezier Games. It's currently funding at $500,000 of its $10,000 goal with almost 4,000 backers. This one ends on Tuesday, February 12th with an estimated delivery of October 2019, or Essen. 
It's $99 for the game and also $149 if you want to include all of the player boards. That is a pledge of $149, not an addition of $149, correct? Very true. So this is a fully revamped and complete edition of Suburbia, including both of the past expansions, Suburbia 5 Star and Suburbia Inc., plus two smaller expansions, plus promo stuff, and a new expansion called Nightlife. They completely redid the art. Uh, it has game trays inserts for all your organizing needs. Uh, it comes with metal currency. All of the tiles are 20% larger. It has wooden bits, and it has a giant tile dispensing tower thingy, plus all of the promo items they've ever released for Suburbia. It's literally everything Suburbia in this box for 100 bucks. You also get to pick your player colors, which is kind of interesting. In the base box, you choose which five of the 20 available player colors you want. And each of the player colors is tied to a specific city as well. So you get that particular city's border, board, and also one tile that represents that particular city. They have unlocked a stretch goal that all of the boxes will come with all 20 of the city tiles. But obviously, you'll only get whichever five player boards and player tokens you want. With the exception of that $50 more pledge, you can get the additional 15 player sets. So you have a complete, literally everything Suburbia set. So it's actually like a really great value if you're a big fan of Suburbia. I think that might be a little bit of an overstatement. I think you went online and buying on your typical online retailer type of price point, Mm -hmm. you could get Suburbia and the two expansions that have already been released for like $75, if I remember correctly. It's like 80-ish, yeah. But still. Okay. Now, looking at the price points of the expansions, if we say even that the new one was a little bit more than that, you're at just over $100 Mm -hmm. for the three expansions and the base game. Mm -hmm. So if you didn't own any of Suburbia, you could get the lower pledge value for about the price that you would pay for all of the things individually. Yeah. And if you owned any of it, buying this is going to increase your cost by whatever the cost of what you bought before was. Yeah, true. So I feel like this is a pledge that's really for people who like Suburbia but don't own any Suburbia, which I'm sure there are lots and lots of. Oh, yeah. But at that point, that's the only time it's a value. Yeah. Well, it's definitely true that if you already had a bunch of Suburbia, you know, like you're that big of a Suburbia fan that you got that plus the two available expansions, you probably had put in 100 to 120 early on prices on a lot of that stuff. 100 bucks, another 100 bucks to get that content. I don't know. I think the thing that's exciting and interesting is that if you are a fan of Suburbia, maybe you've played the app or maybe you've played somebody else's or a store copy, but you never really took the plunge on it because, frankly, original Suburbia didn't visually look super great. It was okay, but it like it didn't pop out. The new art and the upgraded components, the bigger tiles and all the game tray stuff seems like it's a really good complete package if you don't already have Suburbia. We've had conversations in the Punchboard Media Slack channel where there's a few people talking about this, some people that are big fans of Suburbia and they're trying to decide if it's worth it for them. And then somebody else, I think it was either Eric or Patrick, said, I'm just going to wait for somebody else to sell their complete collection to get this new thing and then I'll have all the Suburbia I want. That's, I mean, that's true. People are going to replace their collections because Mm -hmm. that's, I mean, it's it's neat to have the deluxe edition of something. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think that this is definitely for somebody who's going to get the whole thing in one fell swoop, not already has a bunch of the pieces. Well, if you are interested in suburbia stuff, you've got a little bit of time to check that out. Up next, I have a first-time publisher bringing a game called Rival Restaurants to Kickstarter. This is from Gap Closer Games. It's currently funded. It's at $76,000 of their $30,000 goal with a little over 1,000 backers. This one ends on Tuesday, February 19th with an estimated delivery of October 2019. You can pledge it for $49 for the base game or $64 to upgrade to acrylic tokens. This is kind of a whimsical-looking three-to-six-player restaurant management game. You're collecting ingredients to fulfill recipes. It's that kind of, you know, standard mechanic stuff there. But it has some interesting things that it does with simultaneous and real-time play, so there's no real downtime no matter what the number of players are. I really enjoy that in any kind of game where you've got, like, recipe building or something where you're collecting items to go fulfill cards that you don't have to sit there for four or five turns while somebody else is doing their stuff. The way that it kind of works is you have first you get your you have a phase where you get your income and you kind of choose where you're going to go on this central board that's the different markets. And then you're going to have one minute where everybody goes to their markets and then you can do a bunch of real time trading and negotiating and maneuvering around each other to get exactly what you need so that in phase three, then you're going to obviously fulfill recipes and do stuff like that. 
The other cool stuff here is that you've got a bunch of different individual chef powers. I think they're looking 10 or more different individual chefs that you can choose from, and also different restaurants for your personal player board. I think there's six total right now, and there's also some action cards that increase a little bit of player interaction. I have a feeling this is going to appeal to people who like the concept of Kitchen Rush, but didn't want to do it cooperatively and wanted to slap each other a lot. It's kind of like competitive, overcooked kind of in a way, not, you know... The entire game's not real-time, but it has that real-time wheeling and dealing mechanic in the middle of it, which seems like a nice idea. So, I don't know, this is a first-time publisher. It looks like they've done their work on it. It's been in development for a bunch of years, and this is the first time they've brought a project to Kickstarter. It looks really cute, and if that seems like the kind of thing that's interesting, I'd encourage you to take a look at it. How much of the uh, expansion, or not expansion, but additional content that they've unlocked, did it look like they had already pre-planned out and everything? Uh, most of it is additional chefs. And, okay. you know, different chef powers. And I, it looks like, judging by their stretch goal tracker, that the they've got all of the further chefs planned out already. So it's just a, whether or not we're going to be able to include these things we've already designed. Okay, because looking that, at that October date, oh yeah. <laughs> uh, for a first-time publisher, I was like, mm, maybe. Yeah, and they do have a lot of their stretch goals related to component quality upgrades, uh, thicker card stock, thicker board stock. So I appreciate those kind of stretch goals rather than, here's 50 new recipes, here's an additional module, here's the entire thing on the side that's another board, and here's different kinds of ingredients. So it seems like that they are bringing this thing to the table complete, and they're just trying to figure out what they can economically fit into the box. But yeah, you're right. October 2019 for a $50 box kind of game, you might see that slip to November, December. I wouldn't be too surprised. But frankly, this is the kind of thing that I love seeing in Kickstarters is first-time publishers, first-time creators, first-time game designers who have done their work and put together a product that looks really cool. It's not just the pre-order store. You know, this is a, hey, we really want to do this thing. So, cool. yeah, I'm going to keep my eye on this one. I could see myself playing this at some point. Uh, that is called Rival Restaurants. All right, finally, not a game. But I have Tiny Dice Buddies Apparel. This is coming from Double Feature, currently funded at $2,000 of the $400 goal with 33 backers. This is ending on Friday, February 15th with an estimated delivery of March 2019. Uh, pledges here are multiple combinations of $20 for t-shirts and $45 for sweatshirts. And what this is, is some fun apparel designs based on the Tiny Dice Buddies pins that I talked about probably about a year ago on Kickstarter. Uh, Double Feature does a bunch of fun designs, mostly this Tiny Dice Buddy series. If you, anybody saw me at PAX Unplugged, it's the dice that I had on my hat brim. Just a collection of a dice chain from D4 up to D20 with fun little faces on them, and they're all in great colors. They're adorable. Mm -hmm. Also, the creator, uh, Double Feature, has a bunch of stuff on the Etsy store, which is really cool. It's not super board game related, but they have a bunch of like video game console, kind of like kawaii drawings of consoles. I have a bunch of those and also some D&D &D alignment pins. I have a chaotic good pin on my bag, for example. But the uh, apparel here is a bunch of stuff in the Tiny Dice Buddies lines. You've got like a group collection of all of them. You've got a, the Dice Made Me Do It shirt with an angel and devil die. There's the High Rollers Club. And then she also unlocked designs for the D&D &D alignment stuff as well. This is just somebody that I've been watching for a long time. I really enjoy the work that she does, and I want to give it a, a platform so maybe some people get out there and get some cool t-shirts that kind of had that tabletop vibe to them. Yeah, th I'm all about this. I love the pins that we have, and mm -hmm. the, all the designs look really cool. So Yeah, so please, uh, I would encourage you to check that out. We'll have the links in the show notes, as we will for everything else, and then you can find more information about Tiny Dice Buddies from Double Feature. All right, that brings us to the end of a surprisingly heavy first half of the show. Half? Third quarter heavy. section? It was, there was a lot in there. We ah. talked about a bunch of games. It was heavy. Big old section. Now it's time to go to the recent plays. Want to wear your draft mechanic pride to your local brewery, board game meetup, or board game meetup at a brewery? Check out redbubble.com slash people slash draft mechanic for t-shirts. First up in recent plays, we have Junk Orbit. It's a 2018 release from Renegade Game Studios. Plays two to five players in 30 to 40 minutes. Designed by Daniel Solis with art by Saba Bernath, Michelle Garrett, Eric Hibbler, and Jean Torres. This is a game of picking up and delivering things, point-to-point -point movement, and collision courses. Danielle? In Junk Orbit, you are a space freighter who is attempting to deliver cargo to locations on either the Earth, the Moon, or Mars. The Moon being directly between the Earth and Mars in this situation. <laughs> You're going to do this by launching junk out the back of your ship in order to propel it forward. I don't know why you don't have just, like, propellant and rocket boosters on your spaceship, but you don't. You have to throw stuff out the back of the ship in order to move forward. 
The cargo that you're going to be using are tiles that are placed all around the locations on Earth, the Moon, and Mars at the beginning of the game, and they each have a couple of different pieces of information on them. They have a location that they'd like to be delivered to, they have a number, which is both their movement value and the number of points you'll get at the end of the game if you manage to deliver them, and they've got a color which indicates what planet they need to be delivered to. When it's your turn, you're going to take one of the pieces of cargo on your ship and you're going to throw it out the back of the ship, the number that is written on it. You can choose which direction it moves in and how it moves around the circular paths around the planet. When you reach the intersection of the orbits between like the Earth and the Moon or the Moon and Mars, you can transfer the junk to the other celestial body and <laughs> continue it moving. And then you're going to move your ship in the opposite direction that you threw the junk the same number of spaces. If... Once you have reached your destination, there is any junk there uh, or cargo. Uh, you are going to pick it up, and there should always be cargo at every location. If the junk that you launched out the back of your ship lands at the place that it wants to be delivered to, you're going to score that junk. If not, it will just stay wherever it landed, and if somebody goes to that space later, they'll pick it up. And if you landed at a space that you have any cargo on your ship that would like to be delivered to, you can score those at that point. You're going to keep going until enough cargo has been pulled off the board that you cannot refill it with the tiles that are set out at the beginning of the game for one of those locations. Then everybody's going to get another turn trying to deliver, and whoever has delivered the most points of cargo at the end of the game is going to be the winner. Add on to this the fact that each player has their own unique player power that you can choose from. There are two sides to each of the player power cards, so if you are the red player, you have two possible powers that you can play with. And there is one additional point, which is that if the junk that you throw out of the back of your ship happens to end in a place where somebody already is, it hits them, <laughs> and they are going to drop a piece of cargo from their ship onto that location. So you want to make sure that you are maximizing your deliveries both through the cargo you throw out the back landing where it needs to go and you landing where you need to go, and also making sure that you... Uh, you can knock cargo off other players' ships if you get the opportunity. That's going to increase your points, decrease theirs, and have a, a real good chance for you to win that game. <laughs> All right, I want to get it out of the way up front that the box for Junk Orbit is infuriating. It is a cylinder, and it's not like a small cylinder. It's a pretty sizable cylinder. It's like imagine you had a six-inch cylinder that was also 10 inches tall, which is way bigger than this needs to be for what there is in the box. That's kind of all I will say about it, because it is really pretty, and it does, you know, have cool, fun art on it. Yeah, I mean, the art in this game is very cool and cute. There are, there are space cats that need to be delivered to a lot of places. <laughs> but yeah, this is not going to stack nicely on your shelf, since it's a cylindrical tube. Yeah, and this is not the only one that Renegade does. That's one of these big, round cylinders, and they need to stop. They have a, a cat game as well that's oh. round. So, Renegade, I'm watching you. No more cylinders. They're hard to put on our shelves. As for the gameplay... I really enjoy this game. Um, it was one that our friend Will brought to one of our game nights, and we had a chance to play it. It was just like the end of the night, and I'm looking at games and like, I, I want to play Junk Orbit, because I'd never had a chance to play it before. Um, I trust Daniel Solis' designs. He does always does some interesting things. And this was the kind of game that I really wanted to see how it works, because I feel like Pick Up and Deliver has an opportunity to be just super dry, unless it's got a fun theme around it. And this one is quirky and weird enough, with enough interesting mechanics that I think it is worth taking a look at. This is definitely not a complicated game. It's fairly simple. You're moving around this track, which is essentially two figure eights joined up at one of the loops, and you're trying to deliver cargo to locations on one of these three planets. But there are a lot of interesting considerations that you have when you're trying to plan out your turn. Because, A, when you throw something out the back of your ship, you're giving away points most of the time. There are some starter junk pieces that are not delivered anywhere. They're just nuts and bolts that you throw out the back of the ship, and they're only worth one or two points of movement. Mm -hmm. But if you want to go any farther than that, and if you would like to actually make more than like two or three deliveries, you need to go farther than one or two spaces, you're going to have to throw out tiles that are worth a good number of points. So you need to strategize, what can I keep that's going to allow me to make multiple deliveries? What can I throw out because I'm never going to be able to get over there in time to make a multi-cargo delivery? How am I going to pick up cargo that I'm going to be able to deliver on the way to deliver the things that I'm already getting? So maybe you can throw a single piece of nuts and bolts out and move only one space, but you pick up some more cargo that's going where you're already going. 
you spend a turn, but by the time you get where you're already going, you're going to be getting a whole bunch more points. So there's always a good combination of the cargo on your ship and the stuff that you can actually get to available to consider, which is good, but it also means that if you're playing a five-player game, which you can with this game, it can take a while to get back to you because everybody's looking at their cargo and considering, well, if I throw this, then I go this many spaces and it ends up here and I pick this up. (laughs) Well, can I deliver that with something else? Is there anything that I'm going to get there that's going to get me to any of the locations that I need? And you're considering that for every piece of cargo on your ship, which can be quite a few by the, you know, the middle to end of the game. Mm -hmm. With five players, this was a little long, but I think it was it was fun and interesting at three or four. Yeah, and I'm a little frustrated that it was so long at five players, because as you increase the size of the game for four or five players, you start adding satellites onto Mars. So you have more spaces, more places to go, more tokens, obviously, of different locations that uh, Junk wants to go to. But you also just get this kind of interesting setup as you've got multiple things coming off of Mars. There's Instead of just a linear kind of the nested figure eight, there's two different things coming off of Mars at that point. And then you've got to think about, okay, well, I can swing around this way to this, so on and so forth. And I really like the shape and size of that board more than I like the three-player board. When we played a three-player, it was very straightforward, and which is good because at three players, it obviously hums a lot quicker. We're not taking as much downtime between turns, but I like the expansion of that four- and five-player board. I think that's a, a neat idea. I do really like the thinking and the planning ahead that you get with a pickup and delivery game like this, where you are trying to do multiple deliveries in the same kind of general arc of movement over a few turns. And I really felt great any time I launched launched junk out the back and it made it to its destination and that moved me forward the same number of spaces I need to do to get two other pieces of junk delivered because that's where they were headed. And, you know, there's a lot of interesting kind of moments that'll sync up like that. I will say that if you ever get to a point where you don't have a whole lot of junk in your cargo hold, it's going to be kind of a pain in the butt to pick more stuff up because you're only going to have one tile at a time. So you've got to really plan ahead in that regard so that you've got a bunch of stuff to work with and throw out. Stopping on a big stack of four or five tiles, even if there's nothing there that you particularly want, might be good because then you just have more cargo to jettison out the back. So that was nice. All in all, I'm glad we had a chance to play it. This is the kind of game that I probably would have overlooked because I'm frustrated by the box and I didn't want to have it on our shelf. (laughs) But, you know, thankfully, Will does not have that particular obstacle and brought it to Game Night one night. So, yeah, I really enjoyed my plays of Junk Orbit. I thought it was a fine game. I would certainly play it again if somebody wanted to play it again, but it's not something that's going to leap out at me and be something that I'm requesting to bring to the table. Mm -hmm. It is a fairly simple, straightforward pick-up-and-deliver game. And while the theme was a little bit fun and I did like that there were interesting decisions to be made, it didn't change up just picking something up and delivering it enough for me to be like, oh, that's really clever and I really love the way that works. It was a fine game, but it wasn't a standout game to me. Cool. Moving on. Is it time to go into the zone? What zone? Oh, you know which zone it is. It's the Karka Zone! I mean, I suppose it is. You just did. You did the thing several times. We don't get to use the knob as much as we used to. We're kind of spacing out the Carcassonne more uh, because when you play Carcassonne every week for six months, it does kind of get a little bit repetitive. But we have Carcassonne. It is. T- if, by the way, if this is your first time tuning in an episode of Draft Mechanic, we've been on a quest to review every single Carcassonne game since May of last year. So if you ever wanted to know anything about any Carcassonne game. We've probably talked about it, and if not, we're getting to them over the next few months. I think we're actually going to get everything done by Geekway, which is where we started this thing in May. We've only got like three or four left to go. We want to see. We've got Gold Rush. We've got Card Cazone. We've got Hunters and Gatherers. Yeah. Is that it? That's pretty much it. We've got all the mini expansions. Maybe we'll do that for the Expand of Palooza episode. There you go. I don't know. Okay, Danielle. 2018 saw the release of a new title in the Carcassonne Around the World series. I keep saying Carcassonne. It is Carcassonne. I know that. I'm just so addicted to the Carcassonne that it comes out that way. Anyway, Carcassonne Safari, the 2018 release from Z-Man Games that plays two to five players in about 35 minutes, designed by, what a surprise, Klaus Jürgen Verda, with art by Anne Heidsick. This is a game of tile-laying, set collection, and giraffes. I'm sorry, what? Giraffes. It's a silent G, or a soft G. Danielle, tell us about the safari. How do do we go? 
Carcassonne Safari is a lot like regular Carcassonne, honestly. So as usual, I will start with a little basic explanation of Carcassonne. In Carcassonne, you are laying tiles down to complete features. You are going to connect features to the same feature on the sides of the tile, and you will be laying out little meeple tokens, little wooden meat men, that you're going to put out onto each of the features to claim them as yours so that when you complete, you get the points. In regular Carcassonne, there are four types of features. There are cities that you get points for when they complete. There are roads that you get points for when they complete. There are monasteries that you get points for when they are completely surrounded. And there are fields. The farmers will go into them and they will score at the end of the game. Carcassonne Safari has a lot of similar scoring things. Instead of cities, it has jungles, which again, once you've placed your meeple into them to claim them, you're going to get points for once they complete. And it has animal trails, which replace the roads, and they will score similarly to the jungles that you're going to get points for them when they complete. The difference being that in regular Carcassonne, you get points depending on the size of the feature that you complete. In Carcassonne Safari, there are animal icons of the five different types of animals included in the game. And when a feature that is a jungle or an animal trail completes, you're going to get points based on the different types of animals that are on that feature. If they're all the same type of animal, you're only going to get points for having one animal, whereas if you have all five, you're going to get the most points for having all the different types of animals. It is, I believe, one point for one type of animal, three points for two types, six points for three types, etc. going up your normal scoring breakdown for that type. There are also some bird icons that are in the jungles. You will get one additional point and a completed jungle for each bird icon. So that is an opportunity to get some more points. In Carcassonne Safari, the monasteries are replaced by baobab trees. You can place your meeple onto one of the baobab trees. And when it is completely surrounded, so the same way a monastery would score, you will receive additional animal tiles. You'll also receive some when you place your maple on that tile. And these animal tiles are completely different from anything that are in regular Carcassonne. You are going to start with some at the beginning of the game, and you can do a number of things with them. You can add them into features that are about to complete that you have claimed to increase the different types of animals that you have in them. Or you can start a watering hole, which is sort of what takes the place of the farmers in Carcassonne Safari. There is no realistic farmer equivalent, but you are able to start watering holes in the field, or I think they're savanna areas Mm -hmm. that are on the map that would generally be considered fields. If you don't want to place a maple on one of the features of the tile that you've just laid, you can take a one of your animal tiles that you have, and they're all quarter circles, and you can place it out in the savanna on a space where four tiles meet, where there are no features at that intersection. You place your maple on it, and the first animal tile that is at that watering hole gives you three points. Other players can then, on later turns, instead of placing a maple onto their tile, add a different type of animal into the watering hole for increasing the amount of points. The second type of animal that's placed into that watering hole is going to get four points. The third type of animal will get five points. And the fourth type of animal, which is obviously harder to place because there's three that's already been disqualified from going to that watering hole, will get six points, but when it completes, the person who started the watering hole, who still got their maple on that watering hole, is going to get three additional points. So starting a watering hole and having it complete gets you six total points as well. Then your maple comes off the board and that watering hole is complete. You're going to keep going until you run out of tiles, and then whoever has the most points, I mean, you'll, you'll do some final scoring to close out things that have not been completed, and whoever has the most points at the end of the game is going to be the winner. So as we've been going through all of the different Carcassonne spinoffs, expansions, and stuff like that, everything obviously brings different stuff to the table, because that's the only reason to ever have expansions, I guess. This one definitely focuses on the scoring side of thing rather than encouraging you to build in different ways or, you know, build in specific directions. And it does it with its two major things. First, it changes up the way the scoring of a feature works. You get that very... Uh, the different kinds of animals kind of pyramidal scoring thing that honestly at a certain point makes a feature not worth growing once you have enough animals in there. And then it also gets rid of the long-term planning that you get with the farmers, which is a pretty much a staple in Carcassonne games, having that farmer feature in there that gives you some kind of a long-term planning thing. It obviously brings in other things like that watering hole is kind of a long-term thing. And then also using your animal tokens at the right time is kind of also a long-term thing in that you want to use those things effectively at the right time. 
But I feel like the changes in the scoring encourage you to mess with other people's features less. And that's kind of what makes this a interesting spin on a Carcassonne system to me. I've always been a long-term planner. I think one of the biggest conversations we have back and forth whenever we're in the zone is that I love farmers and you hate farmers. I do. And Not I, I have at least one other person in our group <laughs> on my team who was very happy to yes. see there were no farmers in this game. Not, not actual farmers, of course. Farming no, farmer, is very important. Farming is fine. Farmers in Carcassonne. Carcassonne farmers. I like farmers because they encourage me to think long term and use the spatial setup of Carcassonne to my Steal advantage. Steal other people's points. Yeah. But the spatial reason is why I do it. I love being smart with where I'm placing my tiles. Carcassonne Safari, to me, is more about making your features as efficient as possible. And I think that's kind of what I'm talking about when you talk about the the the, uh, the jungle areas and the road areas, is you want those things to be efficient. You don't want to make them huge, and you're not trying to make them in a way that you're sneaking in other people's stuff as much. You want to make it efficient, get a good variety of animals in either that jungle or that uh, animal path before you close it out and get your points. Yeah, I definitely agree with you that it encourages you to mess with other people's stuff less. Mm -hmm. It is often much easier to just start your own feature and get it up to a level that it can score a decent amount of points and then close it out than to try to work tiles into a position where you're going to steal somebody else's feature. Because in this game, unless you are able to get two meeples into somebody else's feature you're just going to score with them. So you're both scoring and you're never scoring a huge number of points. Yeah. I mean, if you get all five types of animals in there, I think you get like 15 points plus birds. Yep. But more often than not, you're going to be scoring three, maybe four types of animals if you place an animal tile in there. So you're talking about 10 points. It's probably better to just start your own little area and not have to worry about building within the constraints to sneak into somebody else's feature. You're going to be wasting a lot of tile placements and energy trying to take those points away. And there are so many ways in this game that the scoring is dependent on getting your own points, but weighing how many points that's going to give to the other person or what that what value that's going to give to the other person. Mm -hmm. Those animal tiles allow you to start watering holes. And when you start a watering hole, you get immediate points for being the person who started it. Other players can play into that and get higher value of points than starting their own watering hole. Like I said, you get three points for starting a watering hole, but you're going to get four, five, or six points for playing into an existing one. But you have to weigh, do I want to get more points from my animal tile placement and move that other player who started the watering hole closer to getting their additional three points when it closes out? Or do I want to start my own so that I get three points now? Maybe it's a little fewer points than playing onto an existing one, but I'm going to get points at the end, hopefully, and that'll be more worthwhile to me because other players that are playing into my space are getting me closer to those points. There's also these ranger meeples, which are little jeeps that you place around the outside of the board. Jeeples. Indeed, jeeples. <laughs> um, and you place them around the outside of the board. And if a player plays onto that square, the or the non-existent tile that they're living on, uh, it moves the ranger, but they're going to get three points. So you can use those as kind of like a bait. If I'm going to move the ranger to a space that I really need completed... When you play into it, you're going to get some points, but it means that maybe the feature that I would like to get closed out is going to get closed out. You can take some points for yourself, but also be very aware that you're giving points to another player. I will say, out of the stuff in Carcassonne Safari, I feel like the Rangers is the segment that missed the mark for me. They exist. There's two of them. There's only two of them in the game. And they exist. And it, at the beginning of the game, it seems like, oh, yeah, I'm going to place this exactly where I need to get somebody to place that tile for me. But you don't really have a whole lot of opportunity to move the ranger unless you're already moving the ranger to build your feature. You can take... If you don't take a meeple action or a watering hole action on your turn, you can choose to move the ranger, not for any points, but you just get to move them, which seems like a good option, but it comes up so infrequently for me that I'd rather just start a new watering hole. And it's there, I feel like it's to encourage you to build in specific directions or to, you know, kind of direct where the 
board is building out. But I didn't see it come up super often unless somebody was scoring on their own features. Oh, I had it come up a couple of times in games, and I used it a couple of times. Because if you get to a point where you either have very few animal tiles or the animal tiles that you have can't be played into any of the existing watering holes because there can only be one type of each animal at a watering hole. Maybe I've got, like, two elephant tiles and all the existing watering holes already have elephants in them. And I draw a tile that doesn't really add much to... or adds to a feature I already have or I don't want to start a new feature for some reason. Normally, that, that would feel really frustrating when you draw a tile and it's a dumb tile that you don't want. And in regular Carcassonne, it's like a road to nowhere tile where you've got a road and it's just one additional point and you put it on the end. Mm -hmm. Well, in Safari, one additional road tile doesn't actually guarantee you any more points. It could be either no animal or an animal that you already have on your road. And that would be even more frustrating. So I feel like the Jeep gives you an option to do something that is going to further your game, even if the tile you draw doesn't further your game and the animal tiles you have don't further your game, it gives you something that you can do on every turn that's going to make it so that you're in a better position than you were when you started that turn. Okay. And I like that. Yeah, I wasn't looking at it from that perspective of of, this makes my useless tile worth three points. I was looking at it from the perspective of I'm going to put this ranger in the right place to make somebody else play here. You're absolutely right. You know, it is nice to have your nothing tile be worth three points, especially since three points is the minimum number of points you'll get for having two different animals in a feature. So Not even only that, but like, if I place out a tile and it doesn't get me anything right now, at least I can put that ranger in a spot Mm -hmm. that when you take the bait on that ranger, my forest gets closed out or something. If I'm not drawing forest tiles or jungle tiles, I can make it so that somebody else, especially in a higher player count game, will finish that out for me because three points is a good number of points. I dig that. I hadn't considered that. So how about the Baobab tree? This is an interesting change up here in that it's the only way you can get the animal tiles, those you know quarter circles. And I was... At, <laughs> early on in every game we played, people asked, well, how many of these are there? And thankfully, there's a ton. You know, in your base Carcassonne, you have six, maybe seven monasteries if you know you put extra one in there. But in this, I think there's 20 or 30 tiles that come with a Baobab tree on them, meaning that you're going to have a lot of opportunities to get more of those animal tiles. But it is an interesting feature in that you get something for playing on them immediately, which is not the way a monastery usually works. Usually you have to wait till they're completed. And then you get a few more at the end once it's completed and, of course, get your meeple back. I think that the only way that this works is they brought the number of meeples you get back up to six, a lot of these spinoffs we've been playing, you get four meeples or so because they're encouraging you to be smarter with your meeple placement. If you had your meeples locked into Baobab trees that were just never getting completed, this would be grinding to a halt. So I'm really glad that they brought that number of meeples back up for this. Agreed. And it was also interesting to explain to people that when you place on the Baobab tree, even when it completes, you don't ever actually get any points for it. Mm-hmm. You get two animal tiles when you place it, and you get two animal tiles when you complete it. It works actually fairly similar to the watering holes, like starting a watering hole gets you some points, and then once it's completed, you get points at the end of the watering hole. But you never get points with a Baobab tree, you just get animal tiles. But those animal tiles are so critical to the way the scoring in the game works, because you can increase the value of a feature by an entire breed of animal if you have an animal tile that you can place into it when you're completing it. And if you've got three animal tiles and you're placing your fourth, that's four points. If you've got four and you're placing your fifth, that's five points. Mm -hmm. So it's important to keep animal tiles, or if you have no place to put a meeple and you don't want to move the ranger, it's a way to get points, like four or five or six points, to play into an existing watering hole. Mm -hmm. They are a really rich supply of points, but the way that you get them gives you no points, which I think is interesting. Yeah, there's a lot of interesting twists on scoring in Carcassonne Safari, enough that I feel it's worth having in a collection if you have a number of Carcassonne games and you want one that's a little less confrontational than some Carcassonne can get, but also want something that's fresh enough to be interesting, honestly, as a first teach versus base base Carcassonne. When we taught this, we taught people that were Carcassonne players already and also some people that have never played any Carcassonne, and every 
everybody kind of got into it without any difficulty. It, in, it shows you how tile placement works. It shows you how feature completion works. And the different scoring is kind of easy for both sides of that fence to learn. Yeah, I would definitely say that this can be easier to play than regular Carcassonne. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not to say that it is boring by any means. I very much like this game. I think it's one of the spinoffs that I like. I liked Overhill and Dale most. I like this one quite a bit as well, more so than South Seas or Amazonas that we've played both of. But it definitely is, to me, an easier stepping in point because there is less of that combative interaction. You don't have to worry about, you know, a player who is used to coming in and stealing other people's features coming in when a new player wouldn't expect it and taking their feature because that's not really encouraged in this game. Yeah. Carcassonne Safari is nice. I don't love it as much as you do. Um, but then I am always a longer term player game in terms of Carcassonne. Like, I love farmers. I really love the way that the city does the watchtower stuff. Like, those are some of the things that I love seeing in new Carcassonne. I'm glad that it's less on the confrontation scale, especially versus something like the tower or an expansion like that, that is just brutal and mean the entire way through. So I definitely am happy to have this one. And it's one that I would keep if we ever end up paring down the Carcassonne collection someday. I'm not saying that we will. I'm just saying that if we would, I would probably keep this one. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> All right. Well, that is Carcassonne Safari, and that brings us to the end of recent plays. It's time for us to go on to our big feature, perhaps. The Quacks of Quedlinburg. And then when we complete the feature, we get two animal tiles, nope, right? Nope, nope. We're done with that one. Oh. We interrupt this broadcast for a special news bulletin alert. We've learnt that a massive unidentified object, a saucer, has crash-landed near Dorney in northern Scotland. It's too early to say for sure where it came from. However, government sources have told us the craft appears similar to the one that landed near Woking several years ago. That landing came ahead of an attempted alien invasion that left hundreds of thousands dead. Those nearby are being evacuated. In the meantime, the Ministry of Defense is urging citizens to remain calm. Stay tuned to this station for the latest developments. War of the Worlds The New Wave is a two-player asymmetric deck-building game set a few years after H.G. Wells' classic novel The War of the Worlds. One player plays as an invading alien force, while the other player as the human defense forces trying to fend them off. Gray Fox Games is bringing War of the Worlds, The New Wave, and the Irish Sea expansion to Kickstarter on January 10th. Gray Fox Games. Quality games. Cleverly crafted. So our six-pack review this week is on the Quacks of Quedlinburg, which is a 2018 release from North Star Games that plays two to four players in about 45 minutes. The designer is Wolfgang Warsh, and the artists are Dennis Lohausen and Wolfgang Warsh. This is a game of pool building, press your luck, and ghost breath. Our copy was also a review copy from North Star Games. So if you listened to our last episode, our 2018 year review, you already know some of our thoughts on the Quacks of Quedlinburg. It placed in both of our top sixes. However, we have had plenty of time to play additional plays of Quacks of Quedlinburg. And what that means for our review, you will have to wait until the end to find out. We, we still like it a lot. That's kind of a spoiler, but I don't, I don't think that's going to be a real surprise to anybody. Okay, so the Quacks of Quedlinburg. You are a quack doctor in, wait for it. Quedlinburg. No way. Everyone is surprised. Are you surprised? I'm surprised. Totally surprised. Quacks of Quedlinburg is a bag building push your luck game. You have a cauldron board in front of you that is a kind of a swirly, spirally uh, track of spaces that you're going to be drawing tokens from your bag to fill out said spirally thingy. You'll start in the middle and you'll have a little water droplet token, which is the floor of your particular spiral at any time. You'll have opportunities to move it up so you can kind of increase your total score each round of the game. But everybody's going to be drawing these ingredient tokens out of their bags simultaneously on each round of the game. The ingredient tokens have different colors, and different color tokens are going to have different color powers. All of that is kind of determined by the set of cards that you use in any particular game of the game you're playing. There's actually four different sets for each ingredient, which is huge, and we'll talk about it later. But regardless, you have seven different colors that are good, and you start with also a bunch of white tokens in your bag. And the white tokens are bad and annoying. 
The white tokens are kind of berries that are your nothing kind of filler in your potion. And they have numbers on them. Every token has numbers on it that will tell you the number of spaces you'll place that token when you draw it out of the bag. So, for example, if you draw a number two mushroom out of the bag, you'll place it probably two spaces after the last token on your spiral. The white ones are one, two, and three. And those will obviously place just like anything else, one, two, or three spaces after the last token. But if at any time you have more than seven total points of white berries in your cauldron, kaboom, your cauldron has exploded. So you, this is your push your luck element. You want to continue to draw tokens out of the bag, but knowing the fixed amount of white tokens you start with in the bag, you kind of got to be like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to pull out a two right now. I don't think I can afford it because I don't want to blow up and not have points or money or anything. But of course, you're going to do it anyway because it's a push your luck game and you can't stop drawing tokens. If at any time you choose to stop drawing tokens, you can just stop and, you know, not push your luck further, but that's not fun. You're going to draw another token and it's going to be a three white and you're going to blow up and be sad. But regardless, once everybody has decided to either stop pulling tokens or they've pulled so many tokens that their cauldron has exploded, you will look at the space after the token that you drew last, and it will tell you a few different things. One, there's a number up top that's the number of coins you have to spend at the market to buy new tokens. Two, there's a little square that tells you the number of victory points you will get, because people like your potions, I guess, and there's prestige involved. And three, some of those spaces will have rubies on them. Rubies are kind of a, another resource you have that sits on the side of your player board that allows you to do things like move up your little water droplet token so it increases your floor in the push your luck cauldron-y thingy. You can also use them to refill a flask that you have off to the side that allows you to kind of mitigate pushing your luck. And once everybody has looked at their particular space that they're going to be scoring for this round, you're going to do a number of things. First, whoever made it the furthest on their track without exploding is going to get a roll of bonus die. Gets you some bonus points or some rubies or a pumpkin and stuff like that. Pumpkin is your kind of other good filler. It's, uh, you know, just a level one orange token. Um, there's also a stage where some of the tokens, the, I think, black, green, and purple, are going to resolve at the end of the round, and you'll get some kind of bonuses, again, depending on your t uh, cards you're using. And then you're going to have some decisions to make. If your cauldron exploded, you're going to have to choose either between your victory points or the coins that you want to spend to buy additional tokens. If your cauldron did not blow up, you get to do both of these things. Hooray! You Huzzah. weren't a fool in drawing more white tokens like anybody I know here, me mainly. <laughs> um, but when you go to buy things at the market, you can purchase some additional ingredients. You can buy a maximum of two ingredient tokens. They must be of different types of whatever amount of coins you earned on that round. So if I earned 18 coins, I could buy a 12 and a 4. I could buy a 10 and an 8, something like that, as long as they were different kinds. The tokens that you buy are going to be values 1, 2, and 4 instead of a 3, like your white token. So you're going to obviously want to get the 4s because they're the furthest along in your track. They're, they're also so pricey. very expensive. So that's the big decision you're going to constantly be making is, do I want to buy cheaper stuff that gets me more powers as these tokens are drawn out? Or do I want the bigger ones that are going to allow me to move forward on my track further? This is going to continue for nine rounds, and as the game goes on, each round of the game, two of the ingredients are locked away until a certain round, and after round six, you'll have to throw another one-value white chip into your bag to kind of offset all the good stuff you've bought. But you're going to continue going like this until the ninth round, where you do a very dramatic thing where everybody pulls out at all the same time, and then whoever has the most points at the end of the game, well, they're going to be the winner. And I guess the best of the quack doctors? Is that a thing you want to be good at? The most best fake doctor if you're gonna be a fake doctor you want to be the best fake doctor <laughs> yeah that's true so there's a few other things that i skipped over in that that i'm sure will come up in the gameplay here notably some catch-up mechanics that are really cool and also how you score a little extra points at the end of the game but danielle let us start out with components production and all of that jazz okay how do you feel about it i have a generally great feeling about the components in this game i love the the player boards mm -hmm. that are the cauldrons they are very well illustrated. It's very easy to see all of the icons that are on each of the squares. It is easy to keep track of where you should be placing your tiles. It is well illustrated. Everything makes sense. There is a little bit of a player guide on the bottom that reminds you how many white berry tokens you can have before your potion explodes. It tells you what you should start with at the beginning of each game in your bag. I think that the boards are done very well. 
the tokens that you place onto the boards are also done well. They're just little wooden discs with imprinted icons on them for the water droplet that you're using to start your spiral and also for the rat token that you're using, which is that catch-up <laughs> mechanic. The tokens are done fine. They're just little wooden round tokens. The gems are the little acrylic gems that you see in so many different board games. And I know what you're looking at me about. The bags are my problem. I'm leaning ever closer to the microphone because I just want to whisper, Danielle, I hate the bags in this game so much. I don't hate the bags. I I wish the bags didn't have corners. Oh, man. Like, they're they're good quality bags. And I would assume if you had a game that had kind of bigger, chunkier tokens... I wouldn't have this concern, but they're kind of, you know, they're less than an inch punch board chits and they get stuck in the corners of the bag so easily. And I feel like that that's impacting my ability to not draw bad, good tokens out. That's I mean, why I'm bad at it. That, that's why you're bad at it? <laughs> that's why I'm bad. <laughs> I agree that the chips can very easily get stuck in the corners of the bag. And one of the things that as we get further into our plays of this game, I was making sure to do was to rest the bottom of the bag on the table so that I could just like swirl the tokens around in the bag and not actually have to have them rely on gravity to stay where they were so Mm. that they didn't get drawn into the corners. Uh Realistically, what I'm probably going to do with these bags, and you shouldn't have to do it, but it's what I'm going to end up doing, Mm. is I'm going to take a sewing machine and I'm going to sew off the corners so you can't get tokens stuck in there. So they're rounded. Okay. I understand that those are probably way more of a pain in the butt to make, and that's probably why they didn't make them. The bags themselves are just a non-velvety, they're just a stretchy, silky material. Opaque fabric. They're fine. They're fine bags. (laughs) But the corners are, in a game where it is important that you have an equal chance of all of the tokens coming up, if something gets stuck in a corner, that can affect the way the game plays for everyone else. So that was my one quibble i'm 100 percent certain that all of my good tokens are stuck in the corner at any given time because (laughs) that's how we do this (laughs) but along with that discussion i totally agree the component quality in this is really good the art is clean and crisp the iconography is easy to understand once you've been one or two games in and iconography is super important in a game like this as well like we said kind of in that description there's a lot of variability there's different powers and stuff depending on what set of cards you play with and i know that there's going to be more in the future so having a fundamental iconography is really important in a game like this and i think they did a good job with it yeah and i like the fact that all of the tokens have a different icon and the icons are different enough mm-hmm. that you can tell them apart without actually seeing the color because if you were colorblind you wouldn't be able to see those colors Anywhere that a color is indicated, the icon for that chip is also indicated, even on the round step Mm -hmm. uh, diagram in the center of the round board, there is a thing that says, okay, after you have drawn all your tokens, check the black, green, and purple tokens to ensure that you don't get additional points or movement on your water droplet, Mm -hmm. because those are end of round. And even in that spot, it's not just the color, it's the icon as well. So they've done a good job making this colorblind friendly. The one spot that it's not is on the scoring markers. Because your scoring markers are not marked in any way. So I guess if you were colorblind, you would not be able to tell who was in the lead. But I'm sure that they'll tell you as soon as you ask. (laughs) Yeah, I I would hope so. But it actually can be important in the gameplay because there is a catch-up mechanic that depends on where you are on the scoring track. Mm -hmm. We hadn't talked about it yet, but there is a mechanic that happens at the beginning of every round after the first one where you look at where everybody is on the scoring track. And there are these little illustrations of rats that are around the scoring track. And if there is a rat tail between your scoring piece and the lead scoring piece, you are going to get however many rat tails there are between you and the lead player. You're going to have a little rat token that moves ahead of your water droplet that number of spaces. So if Jake had 20 points and I had 17 points and there were two rat tails between us, I would take my water droplet token. I would move two spaces ahead of that and I would put my rat token there for two rat tails, and that's where I would start my spiral. So it is important to know where everybody is on the track, and if you are the lead player, or if you are the third player back. So that would be one thing. Like, you need to make sure that you know where your player color is. Mm -hmm. 
In terms of a learning curve for this game, I felt it was pretty easy to learn from the rule book, and I had a pretty good time teaching this by the second game. You know, obviously first game we learned from the rule book and kind of took our time with it. But as we brought more and more people into playing this game, I found it was a pretty easy teach. Most people are kind of understanding of the push your luck kind of mechanic, and most of our game group is used to seeing kind of the interaction of game pieces like that. So more more than anything, it's learning the strategy of the interaction between pieces that is the learning curve rather than any of the actual mechanics of the game. Nothing in the game felt super unnatural. And going back to the iconography, I feel like the symbology at the bottom of the board that tells you if you bust, then you have to choose this or this is nice to have there. And everybody had plenty of chances to reference back to that as the game was going on. Yeah, I agree with you that the learning curve on this game is going to be for the set of tokens that you have out, because in every game that we played, there was a point where I either figured out or realized I wasn't going to figure out <laughs> what the ideal thing to be buying in that particular combination of stuff is. And that sort of replayability is really exciting, because no matter what combination you have, there's going to be something that's going to give you a really good chance at having the high score and then there's other stuff that you can buy and you have four different possible powers for every color so yeah. you have a huge number of variation that you can have in the set that you have you could play with all the ones you could play with all the ones except for the green one flipped over and etc <laughs> so Usually we go to variability at the end of the discussion, but oh. I feel like it's so integrated with this game that I want to talk about it up front. Like you said, there's four different powers for each of the tokens, and you can mix them up however you want. We've played with three of the full sets. We actually um, have not had a chance to play with one of the sets of powers, but we've played with the recommended settings for three of the different uh, sets out of four. And... I feel like all of them, like you said, they have a strategy that generally wants you to go towards them. But did the variability of this game make you want to play it more? I don't think the, that the variability necessarily made me want to play it more, but it made playing it more really enjoyable. Mm -hmm. Like, I wasn't like, oh, I need to find out what set four does. Like, I'm never going to sleep if I don't play set four of Quacks of Quedlinburg. But when we pulled it out, I was like, oh, okay, we've played one and two a bunch. Why don't we play four? And mm -hmm. that made it feel fresh, even though we've played this game a bunch of times fairly recently. Yeah, It allows you to get more repeat plays in, in a really quick amount of time because you're not playing the exact same game over and over again. So when we talked about this in our last episode, I had this as my number four game. And we had only played set one stuff. And since then, we've played sets two and four. And we also played, spoiler alert, there's yet another variation on ter in terms of what you can play with that I want to get to near the end of the episode. But the additional content that there is in this game is what made me so excited to review this early on. When we talked about it last episode, I said, yeah, I'm really excited to get this, even though we've only played, you know, two times so far uh, at that point last week, I said, I'm really excited to get this one to our feature review next. And it was specifically because of the variability I saw in the future of this game. I feel like I could play Quacks of Quedlinburg 20 times in two weeks, and each game would feel different because of the weird combinations you would get out of different flipping over of those cards. There's so many different weird combinations that even as we played the sets that we were talking through before we came to record today, I'm just like, I really like this power of purple. I want to see how it interacts with the power of red too. It's rare that I see a game that has such a good solid foundation in terms of the gameplay mechanics itself and takes the variability to such another level of this is going to amp up the feeling and the engine building of the game rather than this is just going to change it a little bit and feel like a different thing. I agree. It it didn't change what you were doing, but it changed the way you had to think about what you were doing. Mm -hmm. And that is very valuable to me because if we teach somebody who's never played Quacks of Quedlinburg, Quacks of Quedlinburg, I don't want to have to teach them four different games for the four different sets. You teach the same game and you say, but you need to pay attention to the way the powers interact. And yeah. then it's up to all the players to look and see what you've got in front of you and see how, you know, 
this power may cause this one to be extra strong or this power sort of negates the value of this power so maybe you don't want to buy that second one this this particular game and that's something you can evaluate on your own as a player it doesn't change the way you have to teach the game so going back around to gameplay one thing that i will say is depending on the powers you choose it definitely makes some of the things not super useful. The thing that I'm always thinking about, and it's throughout the number of games we've played, the green token, the spider, no matter what side of the card you're on, it only activates if it's the last or second to last item that you pull out. And there are combinations of powers that pretty much make it useless. And I was a little frustrated to see some of the powers kind of become negated by other powers. The thing I'm thinking about specifically is the mushroom cap in one of the sets, you put them off to the side and then you place them all in at the end, meaning that there's practically no chance you're ever going to use the power of your green spider token, unless you just, well, if, if you don't invest in mushrooms at all, it might come up. But I'm a little bummed also because that's the thing you start with. You always start with a spider. So I feel like I'm just starting with another pumpkin, which is your kind of one space, not anything negative, not anything positive kind of token. Do you know what I mean? Like some of the things didn't work super well because of other things. I mean, I understand what you're saying, but at the same time, in that specific example, your mushrooms were able to be added in at the end of the round, but you were also able to save them between rounds. Hmm, So if you had drawn a spiral that had two spiders at the end and you really wanted to use the spider power then you could just save the mushrooms and add them into your next round and increase your next spiral or if you were on a ruby token and you didn't want to or a ruby space rather and you didn't want to not be on a ruby space because you really needed that either to flip back over your redo vial or because you wanted to move your water droplet forward you could choose not to use that mushroom power Mm -hmm. and I think That while there are some powers that make others possibly less valuable, that it becomes a choice whether or not you're going to use them. That being said, other than those two starter tiles, the one green and the one pumpkin, you don't have to buy any specific (laughs) token. If you think that green is not valuable in this game, you get one early in the game, and that's fine. It's something that's not a white berry that you can pull out to increase your spiral. But if you you think like red is not super valuable in this game, Just don't buy it. Yeah, you're right. All right, so overall, of the bunch of different sets we played, what were the ones that stand out to you the most? What were your most exciting kind of token powers? I mean, honestly, I really like the initial set. It wasn't the most complicated set that we've played with, Mm -hmm. but I really do like the way that the the red played off of the orange, which made your orange filler pumpkins sort of more valuable. Mm -hmm. I like the way that blue gave you more options for what you were going to place. I mean, I really liked the way the initial set works, and I wouldn't necessarily say, oh, never play with the, you know, your level ones are super easy. Those are the easy one to do. I like I liked all the ones we played with. Mm-hmm. I think four was certainly more complicated than one and two, just because the powers had more to do with drawing multiples of a certain type, and you were hedging your bets in ways that you weren't necessarily doing in the earlier sets. But I don't think any of them was particularly, like, outstanding as compared to the others okay the one that stands out to me in set number four the purple one allows you to upgrade tokens that you have depending on how many purples you draw so if you have one purple that ends up in your cauldron you can upgrade a level one to a level two if you have i think three purples you can upgrade a one to a four of some other color and i love that and that's the kind of thing like i want to throw that one in a lot because i like the idea of engine building that exponentially grows like that purple thing would allow it if you get a whole bunch of purples in your thing then you're constantly increasing to bigger and bigger tokens which means you're going to be getting further and further on the track getting more points and getting more coins to spend on more cool things in the future. Those are my favorite kinds of things in engine building is anything that allows me to exponentially grow that engine. So like, I want to probably throw that one in whenever I can in the future. Well, at the same time, though, it is intrinsically limited because the tokens are not unlimited. Mm -hmm. If you run out of purple tokens, nobody else can buy any more purple tokens. And in that particular situation, if you don't pull out those lower level tiles or tokens rather that you need to upgrade, you lose the chance to upgrade them. So if you have two purple tokens, which allows you to upgrade a two to a four and you don't pull out any twos, sorry about you. That's the end of that power for that particular turn. And 
it means that you need to keep putting in those low level things into your thing in order to use that power. And once enough people have purchased a bunch of purple tokens, you're not going to be able to keep buying them to keep getting that power to upgrade. So it is somewhat limited in the amount that you can upgrade stuff. I, I like that it's not crazy out of control. So moving on to the discussion about the um, the push your luck part of the gameplay, did you feel like you had a good control over whether or not you would bust on each turn? Yes. Okay, so? I felt that way because you always know what you start with as far as what the white tokens were. Mm -hmm. I know that there is one three, there's two twos, and there is at the beginning of the game four ones. Usually by the, I think it's the sixth round, there are five ones. Mm -hmm. So... When I pull a token out of the bag, I know how many chances there are for me to have a problem. <laughs> if I am at four or less, I, I can draw and there is no chance I'm going to bust because seven is the, the limit and the highest token in there is a three. Mm -hmm. So until I hit four, no problem. Just keep going. Once you get a little bit above that, anytime you draw a token out of the bag, you have to consider whether or not you're going to draw the like what the chances are you're going to draw the t one token that's going to throw you over or one of the two <laughs> tokens that's going to throw you over and you have to sort of look at it and say how far along in this spiral am i is it worth maybe getting a little farther to potentially have to either not buy tokens or not take the points and early in the game it's totally worth it a lot of the time because you're only getting maybe like one or two points mm -hmm. per round and since there is that catch-up mechanic that you'll be getting later in the game, it actually might be fairly valuable to fall a little bit behind early in the game. Yeah. So if you bust on your first or second turn, you take the money and you buy new chits and then your bag is better off. And maybe you lost one or two points for having busted on that round, but you're going to receive a bunch of rat tails so that you can start forward and hopefully now with a better bag move further up on the more valuable spaces on your next round. So I always felt like I knew what the chances were that I was going to bust. And if I took that chance and it backfired on me, I wasn't out of the game in a way that was just going to absolutely ruin the next half an hour for me. Yeah, I agree. And this is something that really took me a long time to get my wrap my mind around is that I wanted to bust early in the game rather than later in the game. And I always got myself in a position where I would bust on round like four or five and I would take the coins instead of the points and it would turn out to be like, oh, well, this is going to be now I'm way behind everybody else. So if you are playing a game where you're going to go pushing your luck more often than not, bust early so that you can get the stuff you need to not bust later. <laughs> <laughs> and I will say that kind of also leads me into one of my bigger frustrations with the game. If you fall behind in the middle of the game, it is very hard to catch up in terms of points. Because, like you said, if you bust on one of the early rounds, you're going to be missing out on one or two or three points. If you bust in that mid to late game you're miss and you choose coins instead of points, you're, you're missing out on like 8, 10, 12 points sometimes. And if you miss out on one jump with everybody else, you're not coming back from that. No matter how many rat tails you get, you're not going to get that far ahead of somebody else that scored a whole ton of points. Unless that other player who's in the lead has the worst turn ever and suddenly, you know, only scores two points or something somehow. Or which they bust even... on a future round. Yeah, but if they bust on a future round, they're just going to take the points anyway. Why what didn't I'm saying... you take the points? Because I needed better tokens to get ahead. What I'm saying is that once you're ahead, it's easier to stay ahead. And once you're behind, you've got to really be smart about it. And you're also then fighting the luck factor to try to catch back up. I guess. I, I never really felt that somebody was in the lead for so long. Well, I guess player count sort of plays into this as well. In mm -hmm. a two-player game, it's much more likely that if you get ahead, you are going to stay ahead. But I think in a three- or four-player game... There is enough of a catch-up push that it never really felt like the person in the lead was guaranteed to be in the lead, especially since everybody else was getting a catch-up mechanic every round. Mm -hmm. I think you do need to be careful if you are looking at busting, whether you just want to stop and maybe not have to make that decision. But if you can properly gauge when in the game is the turning point between taking points and taking coins if you are at a point where you do bust mm -hmm. then i think you can catch up yeah i think that that was the biggest struggle that i had is that that 
turning point is earlier than I expected. I always felt like that turning point was around four or five when I want that turning point to be around like seven. And maybe that's just, you know, the way that I built my bag or the way that we had particularly played those games. But it was most notable, like you said, in the lower player count games. In a two-player game, if you score six points more than me in a particular round, that's a big old step. And I might get three rat tails out of it, but three rat tails does not equal six points on the next round. Um, It just, it encourages you, well, it forces you to play smarter and be less risky, or if you are risky, to just not buy more things and take the VP instead. I think it also forces you to read the feeling of the table. Mm -hmm. If all the other players are playing very safe games and, you know, stopping well before they have a likelihood of busting, you know, if they've got five white berries and there's a chance that they're going to bust and they stop you have to read the table around and be like, oh, okay, they're not going to bust on this game. I need to make sure I don't bust so I don't end up, you know, having to make a choice where the other players aren't having to make a choice. Hmm. And I think that sort of makes sense. Like, if everybody else is making crazy wild potions that might turn you into a dog or might kill you and then throw (laughs) you in the river or whatever, like, you also can make crazy weird potions. But if everybody else is making, like, this water makes you... Tall. slightly less queasy then you also have to make like reasonable potions because otherwise <laughs> everybody's going to know you're absolutely full of it which everybody in this game is it, it could also just be that i'm very mad at the bags giving me a whole bunch of bad tokens that's the real answer of course the bags okay but we have danced around this but there is yet another layer of variability that i am excited to talk about on the back of your player board you have an alternate version of the player board in which the spiral still exists and the numbering is all the same, but you have an additional track at the bottom of your board that you have a second water droplet that when you have the option to move your water droplet up from a token or an effect, instead of uh, increasing your water droplet in the main spiral, you can choose to move the water droplet on this second track up instead. And each step of the track gives you a special bonus. It can be points. It can be free tokens. It can be points or free tokens, really just those two things. But It could be a ruby. It could also be a ruby. Good point. But this is what I wanted Ganshan Clever to be. A completely different game? A completely different game using this one particular... I love tracks that you can advance on. And if you want to go back to when we talked about Randa Riders in episode 82-ish, I just made up that number, but I talked about Ganshan Clever and how much I love the building up your tracks and getting rewards off of it, which this is the same designer as Wolfgang Warsh who designed both of these games. And I got to think that he was designing these games around the same time because this is a Ganshan clever kind of track in that you have a thing that you move up that gives you more things to work with to build your engine faster. I love the inclusion of this particular track on your player board. Obviously, this is not the same as Ganshan clever because there's no synergy between a bunch of different tracks, but you have to at least agree that it looks like one of the tracks that gives you bonuses. Yeah, it definitely is a track that you need to make the decision to pay attention to as opposed to the main spiral, because if you don't put effort into that track early on in the game, you're never going to get to the point where it is more valuable. Now, that being said, I don't feel like it has anywhere near the same level of multiple interactions that the stuff in Ganchon Clever does, but I see where at least it's coming from the same point of design. Yeah, and that point of design is why I was so frustrated with Ganchon Clever, because I saw this mechanic of this track where you're advancing, you're getting bonuses, but all of the parts of Ganchon Clever were that. They were tracks that you were advancing and getting bonuses. I wanted to have that feeling with other mechanics, and uh, Quacks of Quedlinburg gives it to me with the backside of that board. As I was advancing, and I really pushed that track as we were playing with that in the, the one game that we did play with the backside of the board, I got to a point where I was later on in the thing that I was getting bonuses that were giving me tokens, and I was immediate. Oh, no, I was, I, I was able to get a, a token or a ruby or something that allowed me to advance on the track, and then I used that ruby to then get another thing that allowed me to advance on the track to get three points this way. And like, there's a lot of cool level of synergy you can get with that track when you throw in some more cool mechanics like that. I've got the push your luck thing. I've got the rubies. I've got the victory point track of the rat tails. All these things work together in an interesting way. I'm so excited that he put that in at the bottom of that backside of the player board. I had a very different experience with that track though, because like we, you said, we've only played that track once. Mm-hmm. I didn't put all of my attention on it at the beginning of the game, but I also just, the way my bag was built, maybe I didn't build it for that, or 
just the way stuff was being drawn. I know there were a couple of missed opportunities just based on the resources that I had. I didn't end up getting benefits chaining into benefits. I moved that water droplet track track up most of the times I got to move a droplet. I think one time I moved my central droplet. Mm -hmm. But I didn't end up getting stuff that I felt was feeding back into my engine. Mm. I got, oh, I oh, you get a red two token. Okay, that's fine. I already had red tokens. And in that particular version we were playing, you really only needed one red token. And if you got it, that was good. And if mm -hmm. you didn't get it, then okay, you didn't get it. I never got to the point where I was getting stuff that felt clever and felt like it was feeding back. I think maybe once I got something that I that allowed me to do anything else. So I do feel like because there is a little bit of randomness and because everybody can be purchasing for a different strategy, it may feel really, really clever if you get the setup where it works. And it may just give you a couple extra small points. Mm -hmm. Well, here's hoping that with the forthcoming expansion, which apparently has been confirmed, there is an expansion, uh, Dicrowder Hexen, that is not yet officially announced in the U.S., but... North Star Games probably will have it at some point. I can only assume that they will since they had the base game. But, you know, I'm hoping that they lean more into that and give me more of these cool kinds of synergy opportunities in the future. And maybe there's even just more synergy in the different cards uh, for different tokens that we want to put out. Maybe there is some really crazy combinations that will allow us to do more in the future. But to kind of tie it back into the beginning, the reason that I'm so excited about this game is not just the solid foundation of the game, but the potential that it has for really awesome synergy, which you only really get in kind of a bag building or deck building kind of engine builder game. I agree with you that synergy is definitely the really strong suit of this. While I don't necessarily love that bottom track on the back of the board as much as you do, um, and that may just be because I haven't found a way to get it really perfectly integrated or because, you know, it felt like it took away from the main focus of my game, I do love the synergy between the the tokens themselves that you need to look at what is out there and find a way to buy stuff that feeds back into the powers that other tokens are giving you so that every time you pull a token you're not just pulling the number on the token you're pulling something that's going to make the next token you pull more valuable either it'll move further or it can be screened because you have a blue token in one of the things that lets you check to make sure something is you want to place it before you place it, or it allows you to put one of your filler tokens back. You need, you need to make sure that all of your placements are serving double duty. Cool. Well, let's wrap it up. You got a final thought, Danielle? I really like Quacks of Quedlinburg. It has a lot of different interesting mechanics that can work together. It's got the pusher luck. It's got the bag building. It's got that bottom track on the back if you want to make that that specific type of decision and get that feedback loop working it has enough variability that you're never playing the same game twice or you're not always playing the same game twice and it is fun and goofy on top of that i feel like i can teach it to anyone there are very few things about this game that i would not like extol the virtues of i think it's just the bags with corners are the things that i'm bummed <laughs> out about everything else for this game was super fun and it's the kind of game where we have literally finished up a game and said let's do it again let's mm -hmm. play this game again right now which is something that we do very infrequently the quacks of quedlinburg to me finally delivered on the hype of wolfgang warsh the designer he had the mind earlier this year that some people claim is one of the greatest gaming experiences of all time and i thought was fine it's a neat concept but not something that I'm, you know, addicted to. Ganshan Clever, we talked about, obviously, in the Randa Writers in, in last episode, that has some cool synergy and does some cool things with the way dice interact with each other dice and so on and so forth with tracks. But the Quest of Quedlinburg finally gets the synergy and the building and the kind of exponential growth of a game that I was hoping to get from the hype that I've heard about this designer. And Quacks of Wedlinburg is even then more enhanced by the variability that there is in that box. With one box, you've got four different sets for five of the ingredients. Two of them are always fixed, the pumpkin and the black thing. Um, but five different... <laughs> ingredients that can go four different ways and if you want to you can flip over your player board to the back thing there's so much variability packed in this box that you could play it 
20, 30, 40 times and still feel fresh and still find interesting new changes to it. The fact that there's already an expansion that is coming out in the near future gets me even more excited about this. And I am super excited to see where Wolfgang Warsh goes in this kind of meteor one hour Euro kind of space, because I feel like he's got a knack for it. And this guy might be a real doc. Yeah. How about that? All right, well, that wraps up the Quacks of Quedlinburg. It's time to take a break and come back with some beer pairings because the Quacks are on tap. For more information on the beers we chose to pair with today's game on tap, check out the show notes section at our website, draftmechanic.net. All right, it is time for beer pairings for the Quacks of Quedlinburg, the 2018 release from North Star Games. It plays two to four players in 45 minutes, designed by Wolfgang Warsh, with art by Dennis Lohausen and Wolfgang Warsh. Danielle. Will you lead us off with the beer? Okay, our first beer is from Maplewood Brewing Company in Chicago, Illinois, and it is Charlatan American Pale Ale. Mm. That is a 6.1% ABV, 35 IBU American Pale Ale. It actually won the 2016 GABF Pale Ale Bronze Medal, cool. so it is an award-winning beer. And it has a citrusy and tropical hop flavor with an English malt backbone. This actually is also brewed as a double charlatan, which is their double IPA, and it is available in 16-ounce cans, and it sounds pretty dang tasty. Yeah. Next up, from Blake's Hard Cider Company in Armada, Michigan, that's a cool town name, <laughs> The Tonic. It's a cider, 6.5% ABV. It's a cider with ginger root and cucumber, 12-ounce cans. I like Blake's. They do some really good stuff. I've enjoyed The Tonic in the past. Yeah, this one is a really tasty one, and if you are looking for that sort of goza-ish flavor with the, mm -hmm. the spiciness of a ginger and the cucumber flavor, because a lot of I, at least this summer, I thought we saw a lot of cucumber gozos going around. This is nice and refreshing, but it is also a little bit of uh, having that cider flavor. It, it's a neat flavor and mm -hmm. definitely something that I would recommend. Cool. From Catskill Brewing in Livingston Manor, New York, we have Eye of Newt, which is a Flanders Red that comes in at 6.5% ABV. I added this one because the stuff you are throwing into your cauldron in the Quacks of Quedlinburg <laughs> is like... A moth. You've got some pumpkin, which is normal. That can Man. that can go in a soup. But and you've got mushrooms, which I guess could be normal. But these are definitely not your regular <laughs> cooking mushrooms. And then you've got stuff like crow's skulls and spiders and ghosts' breath and mandrake root. And Eye of Newt sort of just fit right in there for me. There you go. It is an oak aged dread sour, and it actually won the gold medal for sour beer at Tap New York in 2017, which is. Hmm. A cool festival that I actually really enjoy, or I did enjoy going to when I lived up in that area. It is available in 750 milliliter bottles. Cool. Up next from Bar Hop in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, Miracle Cure. It's a Saison, 5.3% ABV, 20 IBU, and this is a clean, dry Saison with notes of pear, white pepper, and citrus. It's available on draft only. Yeah, it's currently available at one of their three locations. They're, um, they, they have three Toronto draft locations mm. and this is available at their their like brewery co I think is called the name of the location hmm. and our final beer is from Lord Hobo Brewing Company in Woburn Massachusetts and this is a boom sauce boom. Uh, this is a New England IPA that comes in at 7.8% ABV and 78 IBU I was honestly surprised we hadn't used this already because I know we both really enjoyed this beer. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, if you put too many of those filler berries into your cauldron, you definitely have some boom sauce going boom. on. Boom! It is a tropical New England IPA with six hop varieties, and in its malt it has spelt oat and wheat. Ooh. It is available in 16-ounce cans. Boom. 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 Cool. Well, for more information on any and all of those beers, you can go to our show notes at the website draftmechanic.net, click show notes, find episode 93, and click links further to your heart's content. Mm -hmm. Danielle does a fantastic job with the show notes and all of the links contained where they're in, at least when the brewery websites allow it. <laughs> Breweries make better websites. Danielle, what are we talking about here with Baltic Porters? Okay, so this, I, I called this a beer sub-primer because we've actually already done a porter beer primer back in episode 38. I did sort of the history of porters at that point and how English porters came about and when they fell out of favor in the late 1800s and the early 1900s and how they came back into favor. If you'd like to go back and listen to it, cut me a little slack on how many times I say um, but it is a <laughs> fairly interesting little segment. The reason I actually came back to Baltic porters was because I was watching the Game All Night 
live stream earlier this month, and Dan the bartender mentioned how much he enjoyed Baltic porters and how he didn't drink enough of them. To which Gil Mello, who was in the chat, responded that they were his favorite type of lager. And my brain immediately went, what? What? No, porters are not a lager. Porters are an ale. I luckily did not run my mouth because I would have been wrong. <laughs> um, I really should have known this, actually, because if you go back and you listen to episode 38 when I'm talking about porter beer, I mention one Baltic porter and I actually expand on the fact that Baltic porters are brewed as lagers and they use lager yeast and it's been a few years since I made that segment so I guess I forgot about it when I was listening to this chat but it is something that is very interesting about this particular style of beer. Baltic porters are descendants of English porters and English porters were really what started the existence of fully devoted breweries in England at the time. They had previously brewed beer mostly at the pubs that they were sold but when porters became so popular, large breweries were built so that the beer could be aged in larger batches. If you go back and listen to it, that's how you had the flood that killed like nine people oh, when one of these... Va- no, that was molasses, and that was in Boston. Oh. I'm talking about porter in London. There's a lot of floods going on. Maybe we should work on that. Um, but when one of these giant hundreds of thousand barrel vats exploded, it caused a very large flood. Ooh. Well... As a side effect of the fact that they were brewing so much of this porter beer because they had these dedicated breweries, the breweries were looking for new markets that they could sell porter beer into because there just wasn't enough demand in England to consume all of the beer that they were making. So around the late 18th century, they realized they could ship this extra porter beer that they had to Scandinavia and then across the Baltic Sea to the Baltic region and even as far as Russia. Since these regions are super cold, having a malty, rich beer was actually really appealing to those markets, as opposed to the lighter, clearer beers that were predominantly lagers that were coming out of Central Europe, like Germany and Czechoslovakia, or what is now the Czech Republic. Those are lighter beers, and, you know, Scandinavia and the Baltic regions are pretty dang cold, so they were all about this porter. For a number of reasons, they actually started their own breweries in Scandinavia and the Baltic regions to brew porter. Sweden's first porter brewery was opened in 1791 by William Knox in Göteborg, and the porter produced here is actually the closest to the English style of porter, while still being called a Baltic porter. It is still brewed as an ale, so they were still using those top fermenting yeasts, and the flavor was fairly similar. As you got over towards Finland, which is slightly farther from England, It was still fairly similar in style, but it was more strongly alcoholic. Finland's Sinebrikhoff Brewery brews a slightly stronger version of the porter that is still top fermented. Once the porter style got to the other side of the Baltic Sea and into the heart of Europe, it was adapted to take on the characteristics of more local brews, which is where they started using the lager yeasts. Like I said earlier, the German and Czech regions we're already using lager yeast. And lager yeast works well in colder temperatures, which is good because, like I said, it's very cold. (laughs) Ale yeast can actually slow down or die off if you brew it in colder temperatures. So when they were starting up their own breweries, since they had this lager yeast already and it was more amenable to the area, that's when Baltic Porter stops being brewed as an ale and starts being brewed as a lager. This was actually made more strongly, I guess, strongly ingrained in the beer culture when Napoleon instituted the Continental Blockade in 1806 in response to the British blockade of the French coast. This had areas that were still importing their porter from England essentially cut off, so they had to establish their own breweries, and like I said, they were taking a lot of the local technology that was already existing. Once that blockade came down, The breweries were already there, so they just kept making it on their own instead of importing it from England. So I talked about the change from ale yeast to lager yeast being one of the changes when Baltic Porter entered the actual Baltic region. One of the other changes is the switch in the hops that were used in the beer. Obviously, the English were using English hops when they were brewing the beer, because it was there, and it's an island, and it's good. But when the breweries in the Baltic region and over in continental Europe started brewing it, they used more of what are considered noble hops and are much more German-style hops. So you've got less fruitiness coming through in the hops, 
which persists in Baltic porters to these days. The lager yeast also gives the Baltic porter a nice, clean, smooth flavor. It should always be malt forward and have a roasty, often chocolatey flavor, and it can have some dark fruit notes, but it's like I said, it shouldn't be fruity like an English porter can be. There shouldn't be any hop nose in a Baltic porter, but hops are important to balance out the sweetness that comes from all the malt that you're putting into it. Again, these are not citrusy hops. Um, they are spicy and they're adding bitterness. They're not adding like orangey, pineapple notes that you might get from something like a New England IPA or a lot of just anybody who's selling an IPA now. A lot of times they're leaning more towards that citrusy profile on the hops. A Baltic Porter should not have that. It should be a, a noble hop profile. There should be a low to medium bitterness from the hops and zero to low hop flavor. So you shouldn't take a sip of a Baltic Porter and taste a ton of hops. You should just get the bitterness from the hops in order to balance out the flavor of the beer. You can definitely age Baltic Porters like many dark beers. You can put them in barrels and that has become a trend that is becoming very popular in American Baltic Porters as well, barrel aging stuff. Really? Americans barrel aging stuff too much? No. No, no, no. way. <laughs> Generally, a Baltic Porter should be between six and a half and nine and a half percent alcohol with American versions coming in on the higher end of that. No. And I was actually, when I was looking this up, I found one of my favorite, like, little weird beer article quotes. It, it says, In the past few years, the Baltic Porter style has grown in popularity in the United States, with many breweries brewing the strong beer. And, as U.S. brewers are wont to do, they took a style known for being high in alcohol and made it higher in alcohol. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's, that's what American brewers tend to do with these types of styles. Yup. So, I had mentioned in episode 38 that Topless Witch from Three Floyds in Munster, Indiana was a Baltic Porter you might want to try. Mm. That's actually when I started talking about it. I wanted to give you a couple of other examples of Baltic Porters you might want to try. Now, there are some breweries that have been brewing Baltic Porters in the Scandinavian and Baltic regions for a very, very long time. But the ones that were predominantly pointed out in almost every article I found are macro breweries, so I'm not going to mention them here. Ooh. I mean, such is life. It, it, is, it is certainly a trial. So there, there, I do have one Estonian brewery on this list mm -hmm. to try. And surprisingly enough, it is available in Charlotte right now. Really? But we'll get to that in a minute. First, I wanted to point out Three Beans from Six Point Brewery in Brooklyn and Framing Hammer from Jack's Abbey Craft Loggers in Framingham, Massachusetts. Framing Hammer is actually like... I think it's like six of the top 25 Baltic porters. If you look at the popular Baltic porters oh, wow. on uh, Beer Advocate, they do a lot of variations on it, and it is a very high quality beer. Also, if you are looking for an article about Baltic porters that was written in the US, if they're talking to someone, it's usually the brewer from Jack's Abbey. <laughs> so if you have a chance to give that a try, I would highly recommend it. The brewery that is uh, from Estonia that I had mentioned earlier is. Pohala, P-O with a tilde over the top, H-J-A-L-A. -A. And the Baltic Porter that I found from them is called, ooh, it's, uh, ooh. it's two O's with umlauts over them. I ooh. don't know how to pronounce that. I'm going to go, ooh. Go, yeah, okay, that's fine. Go to the show notes. There will be links. Um, I know that that brewery is available in Charlotte because huh. I've seen them at Salute. Ooh. So... If you are looking for that and you are on the East Coast, I would at least check it out. Hmm. And finally, it wouldn't be a Draft Mechanic episode if I didn't mention a Baltic Porter that was brewed by Burial Beer Co. Hooray! Which is Ulfbert. I know they are canning that and they are releasing it right around <laughs> now. So if you are in a burial distribution area, look for Ulfbert right now. It is delicious. Get that Ulfbert! So now hopefully you know a little bit more about Baltic Porters, the loggers, which are also porters. Huh. Well, now we know. I'm going to have an Ulfbert later. All right. Well, that brings <laughs> an end to the beer segment. It is time to move on to the final round. Want a second opinion on some of the games we talked about on this episode? Check out some other great content creators at punchboardmedia.com. Already, it is time for the final round where we ask the Draft Mechanics Slack channel their thoughts on a topic of our choosing, whenever we remember to choose it. <laughs> if you would like to join the Draft Mechanics Slack channel, I highly encourage you to just visit draftmechanic.net and click the button that says Slack, and then you can join. It's free, and we talk about board games and beer, and occasionally make puns. Sometimes. 
So, this being the second episode of 2019 is a perfect opportunity for me to ask the Slack, what are you looking forward to in 2019? Is it games? Is it an event? Is it something else, a personal challenge perhaps? And I will start off with a quote from D. Shannon Berry. D. Shannon Berry says, Definitely looking forward to getting Gugong and Netatanka, and I'm also excited for the new West Kingdom Kickstarter. That one is Paladins of the West Kingdom, I believe. <laughs> Mostly, though, I'm just looking forward to playing games, especially with my kids. I'm making an effort to say yes more to what they want to play, and it's a ton of fun, and we're getting some great plays of games that have sat on our shelf neglected, like Dixit and Spectre Ops. I forgot about Spectre Ops, and I feel bad because I really enjoy that game. But it's been a long time since we played that. Maybe we'll have to get it out at some point this year. Paul Imboden says, selling a lot of games. <laughs> the Gaming Hoopla in April of this year. Finishing season one of Time Stories. Mm. Also wrapping up my campaign of Blades in the Dark, so someone else from my group can man the GM spot for a campaign of Scum and Villainy. <laughs> oh, that's got to be such a relief to finally be done with a, a campaign and then somebody else gets to DM for a little while. <laughs> Someday I'll play a game on RPG. Anyway, BJ from Wordy and Gumbo says, I'm teaming up with my buddies at iHeart Board Games to run a live stream during our Southern Board Game Fest. I'm really looking forward to the growth of our local con and sharing the hobby with people from all over our area and beyond. My second is, as always, I'm looking forward to hanging out with board game hobby friends and meeting new people. Love this community. I'm super excited for BJ's group's con thing that's going on, and I'm super hoping that they do an awesome time and are able to expand it more in the next year. So good luck to you, BJ. Mount Popilia says, looking forward to the holiday craze coming to an end so gaming can begin again. <laughs> looking forward to finishing season one of Pandemic Legacy, starting Gloomhaven, and getting all the Kickstarters I backed last year. I'm wondering if it's time for me to go on Kickstarter and update my spreadsheet of games that are coming in at some point in the near future. I don't Maybe. Wanna look. I don't want to look. Dennis says, I'm looking forward to reducing the number of games on my shelf of shame. I'm also really looking forward to digging into campaign play for Arkham Horror LCG with a friend. That's cool. Starting a new campaign is always something to look forward to. Starting a campaign, finishing a campaign, all of it's good. Yeah. Javier said, I don't have a regular gaming group since I moved to a new town, but I'm putting something together at the moment. I'm looking forward to that for sure. I'm also looking forward to starting a new D&D campaign, getting more games and playing <laughs> most of them, and gaming on our new dining table. It's been here for like a month and no games have been played on it. It's about time. Also, I plan to build a pizza oven in a couple of months. And I am definitely looking forward to that. Mm. And the final season of Game of Thrones. So Javier's got all of his looking forward to covered. Yes, Javier, I do expect to see p uh, pictures of your pizzas, because pizzas are delicious. That sounds like a really fun project. The Big M says, looking forward to attending several cons that are mostly open gaming. Mace, Tantrum Con, Mega Moose Con, and Dice Tower Con. Also, looking forward to Escape Plan and On Mars from Vital Lacerda. I am very excited about both of those games as well. Escape plan should be in the next few months, I think. Ooh, ooh. Eric Buscemi said, Playing more of the games that I already know how to play, <laughs> especially the ones that I own, maybe in February. Yeah, you did say that you wanted February to be your no new games month, so I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not in charge of you. Eric, make your, make your own choice. All right, finally, Patrick Hillier with our final words of wisdom for the final round. Con-wise, I'm really hoping to make it to Geekway this year. It's been on my wish list for a few years. This year is my 50th birthday, and I'm looking forward to that and having fun with local friends. That's awesome. Patrick, I really hope we get to see you at Geekway. And anybody else who's going to Geekway to the West, I hope we see you there as well. We're uh, tentatively putting together the Draft Mechanic and Mile High Game Guys bottle share. We're going to kind of do a, a thing at some point, hopefully going to make it happen. And if not that... Let's play a Carcassonne, because that's where the Carcassonne was born, and I guess that's where it sh it's not going to die. The Carcassonne doesn't die there, but no. the, the Carcassonne was born at Geekway, and it shall continue. <sighs> Carcassonne. Only a few more of those left, unless they continue to release games. But Which they just did, so they probably will. Good point. <laughs> that does bring us to the end of this particular episode of Draft Mechanic. So if you would like to get in touch with us, draftmechanic.net is your one-stop shop for all your draft mechanic needs. At Draft Mechanic on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all the usual social media places. You can send us an email at draftmechanic at gmail.com, I guess, if you want to do that. Nobody really uses the email anymore. We're all on the Twitters. We do have a Board Game Geek Guild. That is guild number 2470. So if you have something to say about what we've been talking about, that is a place to leave it. And pick up the Draft Mechanic micro badge, too. I only need 43 more people. <laughs> 
If you happen to be in the Charlotte, North Carolina area, our next game night is going to be on February 7th at Good Road Cider Works. That is a Thursday, and we would love to see you there. Finally, Draft Mechanic is sponsored by Gray Fox Games. Visit grayfoxgames.com and sign up for their newsletter for the latest. Gray Fox Games, quality games, cleverly crafted. The end. No, not the end. <gasps> not As the always, end. I would like to remind our listeners to please game responsibly and tell them that I'll see them back here in two weeks for another round. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Pizza time. Draft Mechanic Episode 93 is recorded on Sunday, January 20th, 2019 in front of a live studio cat. stricken do not go gently into that good life. hey board gamers bj from board game gumbo here back with more louisiana flavor tornado mission we love talking board games that's why we started up gumbo live the number one facebook live talk show dedicated to board gaming each week we interview guests from your hobby publishers designers content creators and you get to ask them whatever you like it's a live show so join us at Board Game Gumbo on Facebook every Tuesday night at 8.30 p.m. Central for another episode of Gumbo Live. And until next time, les le bon temps roulé. Punchboard Media. Where we all bring something to the table. Pull up a chair at punchboardmedia.com.